Our next speaker is Dr. Gambari. Last time when I introduced him, he had about 100 patents and discoveries, and this time he has 110. He's a bright scientist, mathematician, PhD in biochemistry, many famous drugs that are used today, they have been discovered by him. His major topic is cancer today, and he has generated a hypothesis, which was extremely controversial. And based on that hypothesis, he brought a fantastic group of scientists together from all different fields. I'm so excited to have Dr. Ambari back here, and he's truly our hope for the treatment of cancer. First, I would like to thank Dr. Nozeri. Can you hear me all right? Okay. Um, I have been, uh, he has been too kind to me most of the time. I hope I deserve whatever he says. I had to listen to him to see what I am. I, I don't think that's true. That's one. Uh, two, uh, Dr. Nozeri actually introduced the conference today or the symposium today as being the theme being new technology. Uh, I would like to change it slightly from what I've heard so far, and I'm sure what you're going to hear from here, not here on, it is a new transforming technology, not just new, because the things that you're hearing, it is, it's not just new, new doesn't matter anymore. It should change our lives, it should change our future, it should change the way we think, and then we are treated, and the way we imagine things. And then so far, I have been very excited and stimulated. I don't know what to say after the two speakers. I might as well go and sit down. All right. Um, you can tell that I'm not young at all. But when I was young, I worked in academia. And I thought that my job was to ask questions. Why, why? I always ask why. Uh, for instance, one of the questions I asked, why they haven't come up with a cure for cancer? Why Alzheimer's still is out there and there's nothing to do about it? Why? And always refer to they. And then um, in 1982, when I lost my grant, thank to President Reagan at the time, I didn't have any money to support my academic work. I moved to industrial research in our laboratories. And then after a few weeks, I realized there is no why without how. And there is essentially no them, it's us. Okay, it was me and everything around me. And then I said, I have to ask the question why and try to find an answer. And then in 10 years, when I was at Abbott, I was in a team where we developed uh, um, Lupron, the hormone therapy for cancer. And also we developed uh, Cervanta, that is a long surfactant for premature babies, and also started uh, immunotherapy. As well, I saw, I, we developed actually the um, diagnostic, the first diagnostics ever for Alzheimer's disease. That was in 10 years. It's not a short time, but the work has saved probably hundreds of thousands of lives. And then I should admit that it wasn't me, it was the team, the whole big team. For, for uh, Lupron, we had 244 authors on one paper. You can imagine there is no one hand that can clap and that's how I have done since then. At, at the end, when, in my tenure at Abbott, uh, you know, I sort of, they recognized all of that, but I realized I was still limited. I wanted to do things that I couldn't. And I left Abbott at the, at the height of my career to start companies, and you know what happens. You get very humble very quickly. You need money, and you don't get, you have, nobody would give you money. And then it has been 30, 27 years now. I'm right here in front of you somehow. I survived the 27 years of begging for money, getting money, and doing what we wanted to do. All right. All right, this is the title of the talk, A Fresh Approach to controlling auto, 
maladies. I'm going to use some words here. I'm going to define them. They're not very commonly used, and some of them are not made up or made by me. All right. I think I'm going to change my own slides here. You know, what is, I have actually divided uh, maladies, which is diseases, in three different categories. One is xenomaladies, something that is caused by outside agents, like all the infections and all of that. That's very familiar. The other one is automaladies. You would know why I changed this category a little bit later. It's something that is caused by a, an agent within us. Okay, our own cells, the condition, all of that. And the third one is a very strange one that people, you don't know, it's, uh, it's outside agents, but they live with us long enough, like a long time house guest, that become a part of us. All of these, I look at them differently because the way you approach to treat them should be different. Okay, the mistake that we have made in the past is that we treat the diseases that is caused by our cells the same as the disease that is caused by a bacteria or a virus. And that is why we haven't been successful. That is the theme of my talk, okay? All right? And then I'll go to the next one because you can read as fast as I can do as well. anyway. The progress for going forward with automalities is no war, no conquer, and I would say no, no rush, but tame and control and be patient with it, okay? I'm going to explain that a little bit. Uh, in the Nixon time, uh, they announced that the war against cancer, and the goal was in three years, cure cancer, eradicate it essentially. And then, you know, they put billions of dollars in it, and the institution that was formed is, uh, cancer, you know, it's, uh, the, the cancer at NIH, is the National Cancer Institute, still exists and its budget is $5.7 billion a year. And then the three years, I'm, go, I'm sure, is gone, of course. <laughs> so is Nixon. All right, now with the way we look at things, we look at it as if this is not something that you can go and bomb and get it out of here. It's not something that you can eradicate in a short time. But let's work with it, okay? All right, again, um, this is a repeat of what I said, but the important thing is the comparison between the xenomaladies, something that is caused by outside agents, versus automaladies, which is caused by own cells. And then I have used uh, uh, smallpox versus cancer, just for comparison. It is interesting that smallpox was actually, you know, had about, uh, started about 5,000 years ago. There's evidence for that. And in, in the early 50s, uh, you, you had about 50 million people still hit by smallpox. But miraculously, in December, on December 9th, the, uh, 1979, the disease was considered eradicated. Can you believe that? Smallpox is in the past, within that short period of time, because the approach was right, but the cancer wasn't eradicated in three years, as you well know, all right? All right. Yeah, let's sort of Look at how we need to view our 
the problems that we have as the diseases that start within us. All the diseases that start within us are, are a part of us. It's, it's like we have a, a child in the family not behaving all right. It, 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 is, it is not a wild cat that has attacked us. It is real, it's ourselves. And the best way to treat that is to have, see what kind of uh, ways we have for fighting that and strengthen it. And then as you well know, okay, let me, I cannot, all right. Let's start, you know, we're going to use cancer as an example because for the, the, my lecture, my talk, and also Dr. Hatamian's talk is going to be concentrated on cancer. And cancer is more, uh, to people's mind, is in the, more in the mind than anything else. That's why I'm using cancer. But the same argument can be used for other auto maladies. All right, cancer is very, very devastating, as you well know, very expensive. And then uh, one out of every three of us would get cancer by the time in, in our lives. And then, uh, the, you know, the, uh, it, it is very difficult to control that at the time. And uh, in many countries, it's going to surpass heart disease uh, as far as the, uh, death per year is concerned. And here is the cost. Uh, sometimes cancer is so personal, the overall cost shouldn't matter at all. If it happens to a family, the whole family is devastated. It really doesn't matter how much it costs. But nevertheless, it's good to have in mind that what the costs are. All right. Or the history of cancer is very similar to smallpox. Uh, the first time it was described was about 45, 4,600 years ago uh, by an Egyptian uh, uh, physician or Hakim. And actually, uh, he described all the diseases that he saw, a very long uh, document, and then uh, I think number five, 45, whatever. It was something that description fits the definition of cancer now. And the cure for that was none. He diligently put all the cures there. The cancer was the only thing that he couldn't find a cure for. And I can say still, we're not far from it even now because the approach that we have had to curing it, it is not that we didn't try. All right. Now I'm going to go into a little bit of background on cancer and tell you what our approaches are, what our recommendations are, okay? All right, one notion that, here, let me go here, it's better. Can you see me? Can I, is it easier for me to look at here? Is it all right? Okay. I'm going to, there was a notion that cancer was something that randomly and statistically would hit people and then it really wouldn't matter what you do or anything at all, you have no effect on it. I'm going to show you that is not actually true, okay? The first one is difference in incidence, different counties. You look at the range, it's, it's between about 100 to 500 or 400. Therefore, there is not uniform at all. There is nothing that is magic about it. There is something, the interaction between us and the environment. And then here is the, you know, here's the change from death that from about minus 40 to plus 40. Uh, therefore, even the variation is, uh, in the death is different as well. 
And interestingly enough, I'm going to show you some of the drastic changes. For instance, in lung cancer, you see the difference between the lowest and the highest is about 20 times more from county to county. All right, and then from liver, it's about 16, about 15,000, you go down the list. And overall, the difference between county to county is six times. Therefore, it is not something that is fixed. It's not something that is not curable. It's not something that we should say, all right, it's like lightning. I can't do anything about it. Let's sit down and do nothing. And then here is the, the different cancers in different countries. Strangely enough, I'm sure Dr. Hotamian is going to show you a map that U.S. is it's one of the big champions in the incidence of cancer, you know. And then if you look at the Japan incidence of cancer versus Hawaii, and then you see the difference there, but more importantly, the highlighted ones are the people from Japan going to Hawaii, their incidence is getting closer to Hawaii, Therefore, there is, there is a solution for cancer. It is not something that we should accept it as a God-given and let's forget it, okay? All right, the, the, some of the causes that we need to be aware of, I have a list here and uh, most of you know about it. I'm not going to go through that because we have more important things to talk about. And then also the, uh, the avoidable causes, uh, as you know, is tobacco, alcohol, and the diet, and food additives, and uh, you go down the list. And then one of the things that I need to talk a little bit about, give you a little bit of story, is the red meat. It is very interesting that it is people, some people even don't believe that is important or not, the, the, the whole story, scientific story, is at one point uh, there was a, a mosquito that was developed millions of years ago that liked a compound of a complex carbohydrate, and it was accumulated in humans. And then it, the humans were uh, uh, sort of killed by this majority of them, but actually died because of the this mosquito. However, because of mutation and changes, some of us actually survived because we didn't accumulate that compound anymore, okay, that com complex anymore. And then what happened then, the, the whole, our whole body and the immune system started seeing it as non-self, something from outside because we didn't have it. Interestingly enough, later on, uh, the, the, that mosquito disappeared and there was no problem anymore. And then uh, we as human beings started accumulating the same compound back in our uh, cells again. However, our immune system is still lagging behind. Therefore, we take the compound inside, but our immune system thinks it's something outside, outsider and then fights it. And by fighting over a long time because of the inflammation, and then it actually increases the risk of cancer. It's actually real. And then the side story, uh, the, when I was growing up, my family and in, the, in the old country, I'm from Iran, as you probably can guess from my accent, uh, the, every time they made any food, uh, it was a custom to put a little finger and put it in the baby's mouth. What that does, if you get exposed to something that are very young, your immune system gets used to that. It gets, it gets tolerized to it. Therefore, probably in Iran, it's one-fifth of cancer that we have here. That may be one of the reasons at one time I thought that actually have a little bit of that in, in the baby formula because to make, the, make all of us or our children to be, to be sort of tolerant to this compound that is clearly 
causes our immune problem. We can test that also. It's like TB test. You can do the same, put the compounds, see if it's inflammation or not. But it's some story just to tell you the story. That's all. It's just, but it's a very interesting thing. All right. And also it depend, depends on our organ that we have, the, whether we get cancer or not. As you well know, because uh, the, our cells should get out of control, the more division you have in the cells, there is more chance of it. It's, it's like uh, the more cell division, the higher chance of cancer. And uh, as you, you would know, it would be, uh, the least would be heart, eye, and men's breast, and then the high would be blood, lung, skin, stomach, and all of that. And then st stressing immune system, and immune system hyperactivity, as I mentioned to you. And there is always in nature, there is a balance. A little bit of it is good, more of it is not good. Anytime you want to fight anything, immune system, it, it, it actually has to, has to cause inflammation. But uh, too much of it is a problem. All right, let's go now for the treatment of cancer now. Uh, as you well know, it's, it's, you have surgery, radiation, chemotherapy, and I always use prayer there because we need it, by the way, in cancer. And then more recently is immunotherapy. That is where I'm going to concentrate and define what immunotherapy is and then what I think it should be. And then it, it is going to be because we are doing something about it. All right, the, these, are the, these are the ways we can do is general immune therapy. It's, it's like using lactoferrin, but uh, use uh, relaxation, meditation, all of that to change our uh, general immune system. There is passive immunotherapy. Passive therapy is that you give the patient what it cannot make. Patient doesn't make it, but you make it and give it to it. And then uh, we have uh, two very famous drugs. I usually do not use the name of the commercial drugs, but here is, um, it's okay. It's Herceptin and Avastin. Their sales is more than seven, eight billion dollar a year, although it has very narrow application. But it has its own problems. As you know, you add like 400 milligrams of something into the blood. It has side effects, very unusual, but it's much better than cancer. All right. And then the, the more recent ones are checkpoint inhibitors. I, or checkpoint blockers, I need to explain that. Some of you may know and some may not. We tend as, as a human, as a, a live body, to differentiate between our own, it's called self, compounds, proteins, or anything at all, and compounds that come from outside. And it's done by a checkpoint. It's like when you go to a war zone, there is a checkpoint as people move to see whether it's, it's enemy or, or a friend. And what it is that because cancer cells are our own cells, and then our body, there is a checkpoint, would not allow our immune system to attack it. Okay, this, otherwise we would go like autoimmune, which is a pretty bad disease, very nasty disease. Then uh, what happens is because cancer is so bad and the alternative is very bad, we have actually drugs now that push this checkpoint not to do its work. We think it's very good. Actually, it's not very good, it's very bad. We get autoimmune disease. But it's much better than cancer, supposedly. And now there are two drugs for that. And both of them are very unusual because they attack, the, uh, they call the B19 positive cells, uh, white blood cells. And what they do is to go on and actually bind to that cell and then kill that cell. But the B19 cells are all the white blood cells, all, kill all of them. 
because some of them are cancerous, some are not. But in two weeks, all of them are going to be replaced. Therefore, for two weeks, we do not have any immune system given by B cells, and then they're hospitalized. More importantly, if you know, we have something called the, the toxic shock syndrome. If you have a lot of bacteria in your body and you kill them, they produce toxins that actually the toxins kill you and not the bacteria. Here, if you kill a lot of cells, normal plus cancer, they produce cytokine. Cytokine, cyto means cells, kind means something poisonous, okay? We get actually so much poison, it's called cytokine release syndrome. It, the, the cells release a lot of uh, toxin again, the same as bacteria do. And then uh, about 50% of the people that are treated with this, these drugs actually are hospitalized and would uh, do a heroic thing to actually prevent them from death. And the cost for the treatment of the checkpoint blockers is about $400,000 for the drug and $600,000 for hospitalization for you not to die. Okay, and you, you know why the checkpoint is is very good? Because they're, it is heroic, it's miraculous, but it can be also terrible making as well. And then the, we have the antibody uh, uh, drug conjugate. Actually, th that is not very common, but drug means poison here. You add a poison to an antibody, antibody uh, going to find a particular cancer cells, and kills us. This actually anti. We, we, we used to call it the uh, uh, anti antibody toxin conjugate, and they told us, no, 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 you can't call it that. Nobody buys it because nobody buys toxin. Okay, they call it now antibody drug conjugate. All right. The other one is uh, immune cell manipulation that I talked a little bit about. Which, uh, no. Oh yeah, I haven't yet. It's called. Um, you have the T cells. It is called CAR T cell um, um, approach. CAR is chimerized antigen receptor. That is CAR T cell. Is the, it's a cytotoxic T cell. The T cells go and kill bad acting cells, but not cancers, because the cancers are self. Again, you remember that. What they do is go get the T cells from the patient. And then we are doing the same thing, by the way, I'm not blaming them. And then change that T cell, chimerize it, add something to it that would recognize the cells and make it more active, it's cancer cells. And they go to the cancer cells and kill the cell, and then you survive. But by itself, it has some side effects. But it is very, very getting very popular. The problem with that, again, is used for hematologic cancers, they call liquid cancers, not solid. But our program, actually, we are addressing solid cancers. All right, the last one that I'm going to talk about a lot, I don't know how much time, I'm going to have 15 more minutes, I think. All right, is targeted active immunotherapy. And every word of it means a lot. One, first one is targeted. It has to go only to cancer cells, not to normal cells. That is very important. Active means we don't make anything outside and give it to them. It is not passive. Our body does everything. Therefore, the whole manufacturing of the drug is our immune system. We don't manufacture it outside. And immunotherapy means to use our immune system, okay? Therefore, all three wars mean something there. All right, again, this is all definition of what cancer is. Um, we always say that every minute we get a cancer cell, but our, in our body can take care of it, but it gets to a point that our body cannot take care of it, then we need the logical conclusion of that is if our body is overwhelmed, let our body help, help our body to do what it normally does. 
rather than loading it with toxin and doing it all those things. That is what I'm proposing, and that's what we have done, and then you will see that we have good results as well. All right? And, uh, okay. All right, our, our cells, we always complain about how cancer cells are difficult to eradicate, they're very creative, and uh, no matter what you do, they're going to come back or relapse and all of that. You know what? We should be very thankful for that. This is our, us there. This is our cells. If, we, if our cells didn't have that quality, the ability, we would have been dead and elim eliminated as a race long time ago. Our cells are very creative to defend themselves. They can survive, and that is what we are. Therefore, our cancer cells are us. And then instead of being worried about it, let's see what we are, can do to help us to fight the cancer, okay? All right, I'm going to talk about the self-tolerance. That idea is very, very important. As I mentioned to you before, our, our body, our immune system has learned not to react to self-protein, anything that is self. And in order to us to do anything about cancer cells and then help immune system to work against cancer cells or any auto maladies, we should overcome this self-tolerance. And then if you overcome self-tolerance generally, we have actually created a bigger problem than cancer. We need to be very narrowly, very specifically uh, target that. And it, it is very important to realize that. And then it was about 15 years ago or so, we were very desperately working on to uh, help cancer patients to defend themselves. And then it is, we, we actually used our target, which is HAAH, you hear about it, the, the Dr. Hotam Yan's uh, lecture. But if you actually, we loaded animals with HAAH, we didn't get any antibody. We had to do a lot of other things that we can't do in human. Therefore, the, the, the immune system would see it if you injected it, so thank you, welcome. I have had you from, you know, when I was conceived, when it was one cell only, what's wrong? And therefore, there was no effect at all. You know, I was thinking about it, and uh, as a child, if I had a problem that I couldn't solve, I, my hobby was mathematics, I wouldn't be able to sleep in the, in the washroom, in the, on the bus, on the bicycle, in the class, and all of that, I was thinking about how to solve it. We have Hayam's equation. It took me months to solve, but nevertheless, that was the habit that I had, or maybe nature, I don't know. I thought about it for such a long time, and I realized that I can't judge the things that I have learned how to fight something from the eyes of something else. I started thinking like immune system. I said, all right, when I put this thing in here, immune system, it's mine, fine. I have nothing to do with it. What can I do for our immune system to say, oh yeah, I got you, now I'm going to take care of you, okay. And then this self-tolerance has a big mechanism that is different from what we think I said, all right, if we do several things all at the same time, for instance, produce a part of this protein, not all of it, to confuse our immune system, put it on a solid phase so that it have less degrees of freedom, cannot move around to be identified. The, each one of them may not be that important. Also, put it on something and introduce it that something is absolutely immunogenic, meaning as soon as our body sees that, it's going to attack it, regardless of what is on it. All right, you know, you know what? I used to work with bacteriophage, viruses that infect bacteria that would not bother mammalians, our system. 
we actually engineered and produced engineered and produced a vaccine, we call it now, that through a, we engineered the virus to express one third of the antibody, the protein that we're attacking on its surface, 300, two to 300 copies of it on the surface. Now we have something that is very immunogenic. As soon as body sees it, it's going to attack it as a virus. And then we have 300 copies of what I want to be attacked. It is self, but it's on it. And then it is a glob of it, it's not one. And then it's, it's, it's going to be not moving around. It's very solid. And then we hope that this would be recognized as uh, a mammalian, as non-self. And then uh, the person who was actually doing it for me for a couple of years, one time came to me, uh, Dr. Bishwajit, an Indian virologist, told me, Dr. G, look at this. You're wasting your time, your money. Why, why are you doing this? I said, Bishwajit, do you get your bi-weekly paycheck? He said, yes. Are you happy with it? He said, yes. Do you think I can help you more with that? He said, I'm very happy with that. I said, go to your lab and then be quiet and do this. This is, this is something that nobody has ever done. If I know the result, I wouldn't do it anymore, okay? And then we actually, the first time we tested it, in, um, our target is conserved among all mammalians. It's easy to test in mice. And then um, we tested it in mice and tested the original compound that we wanted to attack versus this vaccine. The original compound was 10,000 times more than this. But this vaccine produced more antibody, more immune reaction than any other vaccine that was reported by, by that time, even now. Therefore, we succeeded, we celebrated that. I didn't know whether it worked in, in human or in cancer at all or not. We, we took it forward. We actually filed an IND, investigatory new drug application, and then uh, then uh, FDA was confused. Uh, if, uh, they assigned 13 scientists to it to evaluate for us to go forward or not, and a majority of them from non-FDA specialists. And then uh, Dr. Khatamian actually searched them and said, "Wow, these people are so." Um, highly um, uh, regarded, they may, not, they may not like what we do. Actually, they did. They approved it, and I, they had a lot of questions. They wanted to understand. We went to phase one, and the phase one result was, well, I would say, totally miraculous. We did in a patient cohort group that was very difficult to treat. Uh, we had uh, not only efficacy, we saw T cell, specific T cell production, natural killer cells, antibody production, and then it acted as if we had an outside bacteria that has made us sick, and then we inject that attenuated bacteria in the body. It acted exactly that. Therefore, we have a vaccine now that has never been reported before, never used before, and actually for the injection of it, I remember when we a child, some of you probably remember that you're not as old as I am. They actually put a little bit of vaccine here, liquid, and scratched it. It's called intradermal delivery, not under the skin, not in the muscle, but within the skin. We actually produce that. It's produced by an auto injector that has 12 micro needles that goes to inside the skin, not under the skin of it and injects one milliliter into that, or you wouldn't even feel it afterwards. It's that easy. There's no hospitalization, no injection, no side effects of any kind at all. And then we now, um, FDA has given us green light to go to phase two clinical trial for eight different cancers. And the first one would be head and neck uh, for combination, and then the um, leukemia for monotherapy, and then we have a basket trial for lung and all of those cancers, and then uh, we'll see how things go, all right?
Let me see if I have. Oh yeah, let me go, can, you, can I go back here? All right, just to hand on the baton to Dr. Hatamian, I didn't talk anything about diagnostic. Any good therapeutic starts with the good diagnostics. Any doctor in this group would tell you, any, any person with right uh, mind would think that if you don't diagnose correctly, you cannot treat correctly. We always develop the diagnostics alongside our therapeutic. That was my, I didn't know why not. I couldn't even think of it even to not to do that. And then we have a, a good, we, we call it the, the companion diagnostics, means our treatment and diagnostics go together, all right? And then makes it, we call it precision medicine nowadays. It's not to make big words for it, but you know, for me, it has to be that way. There's no other way. That's why I don't name it at all. And then Dr. Hotamian is going to cover that. And then I'm going to give my five minutes to Dr. Hotamian to describe that. Thank you very much for your listening to me. I hope it was okay. <laughs>